I'm KP Singh, and I work for Google Security in Zurich. And today, Leonardo and I are going to talk about how LSM and BPF change everything. We're going to talk about why did we go about writing a BPF LSM? What can we do using it? And then Leonardo is going to show an awesome demo showing the BPF LSM in action. So why did we go about writing a BPF LSM? I work for a group called Detection and Response. We try to keep an eye on Google's internal systems and detect when unusual things happen from a security perspective. Google has loads of Linux systems, all the way from servers that run key services down to the very laptop that I'm using right now. These endpoints are constantly piping security relevant telemetry data to our software pipeline, which is doing some clever stuff on top of this data. This information is then used by security analysts who use this data for responding to incidents. My team builds the agent that runs on these internal Google-owned machines at the very beginning of the pipeline. So what is the background? What was going wrong? Why did we make the BPF LSM? So the traditional ways of doing this would be using audit D, and audit D was not very flexible. I remember when we wanted to audit environment variables, and the amount of work that needed to be done on audit was quite high. We needed to patch the kernel and the audit user space. We tried using kernel modules, and the kernel modules are a pain to maintain. Even with regular tracing and eVPF programs, the number of places where one can attach to is so high that one doesn't really know what's the best place to observe a particular behavior. And this will be very relevant once Leo shows his demo. And of course, Policy enforcement was out of the question using any of these systems. Security can be broadly classified into two approaches, which work hand in hand. Monitoring what is happening on a system and enforcing, which is taking action based on the monitored, monitored data. Prior to BPF, one could monitor using Linux audit or use perf or the performance API or trace points, build custom kernel modules or use trace probes. And the enforcement was completely separate from all these systems. One could enforce or do Mac policy enforcement using security modules like App Armor, SE Linux, or one could do some sandboxing using SecComp, which is based on the syscall layer. The BPF LSM, which we also call KRSI sometimes, sits somewhere comfortably in the middle and provides a unified and flexible way to do both enforcement and monitoring. Now, there are about 200 LSM hooks. These LSM hooks are a layer of abstraction higher than the system called API. For example, one can execute a process using both the exec VE and exec VE at system call, but they both call the same set of LSM hooks. The LSM hooks correspond to changes in the kernel objects and are placed strategically in the lifecycle of the object and the ongoing operation. This strategic placement ensures that an attacker cannot use attacks like time of check to time of use to trick the security logic into believing something that it's not actually doing. Leonardo is going to show the importance of this in his demo. The BPF LSM can happily coexist with the other LSMs like SE Linux and AppArmor and does not do anything by default. One can load an LSM eBPF program to implement their own custom logic for the LSM hook. In this example, the BPF LSM for the process execution gets invoked after all the other LSMs. And of course, this order can be changed in the config LSM kconfig parameter or the kernel command line. The LSM hook can then write audit data back to the user space using ring buffers and maps, and can also make policy decisions as we talked about. LSM programs are compiled once and run everywhere. They have verified pointer accesses, which is made possible by the BTF information present or compiled with the kernel. We also added local storage or security blobs for inodes, task structs, and sockets. These blobs live and die with the kernel object, making the memory management much easier and can be used to tag security metadata. These blobs are especially useful in conjunction with the, with the Atomics API we added to BPF. And and especially for using or generating custom unique identifiers, for example, namespace IDs or container IDs. Think of implementing a custom logic for container IDs and sending a patch to the kernel. People have tried that, tried to convince people 
for multiple years on what a container is and has not succeeded. LSM programs also can also sleep. This is especially useful if you want to get them to read data from user space, for example, command line arguments. The kernel needs to page in memory, which requires the program to be put to sleep for the memory management unit to page in memory. We also added helpers to get the IMA hashes of files, which can be useful for binary fingerprinting. And of course, we have all the other BPF goodness, like the BPF ring buffer and maps, which help maintain state and send data back to the user space. So what's happening next? My colleague Flora is working on DNS auditing, which has some interesting challenges, and we would like to do a presentation about it at some point. We also want to add helpers for Mac policy enforcement and really make PPF LSM powerful enough to be a major LSM or be able to implement a major LSM in the kernel. We also want to provide more places that PPF LSM programs can attach to, especially useful for auditing events like MMAP or kernel module loads. And we also want to make PPF LSM users to use it more easily by providing an API like PPF trace or something that is more abstract from the kernel internals. Right now, you still need to understand that DPRM check security means a process is being executed, which is not ideal. I'm now going to hand over to Leonardo, who's going to show an awesome demo of the BPF LSM in action. Hello, everybody. I'm Leo. I guess it's my turn now. First of all, I want to thank KP for all the wonderful explanations and for introducing me. And now to explain you why I believe LSM BPF will change everything and for the better, let me first tell you a story. Some months ago, while I was still working on a daily basis on Falco, a security researcher contacted me presenting a very cool bypassing technique. As some of you may already know, Falco, just like many other runtime security tools out there, does its job thanks to eBPF. Specifically, in its case, thanks to the syscall trace points. The Falco BPF probe basically attaches to the kernel syscall trace points with little BPF programs that are responsible for any syscall being called on your machine to extract its argument plus other data and put all of them in a ring buffer. Then, Falco rules assert conditions against those data. For example, the default Falco rule set contains rules to detect crypto mining activities on your host by looking at the outgoing connections happening on your machine. Such rules simply trace send to send message or the connect syscalls and assert conditions on their arguments, alerting if the destination IP, for example, or the destination domain match those of known mining pools out there. Just to give you a sense of what I'm talking about, let's take a look at those rules. Let's take a look at this net miner pool macro used by the rule detect outbound connections to common miner pool parts, as you can see here. This macro basically asserts a condition on the send to and send message syscalls and on these other macros which are defined above here. If we inspect them, we can see that the minor pool other macro checks for destination port and uh, domain name to be in lists of well-known uh, mining pools out there. For example, this minor domains list contains things like this. Okay, so in this case, Falco, when the text specific syscalls with specific arguments containing these values, alerts the user for outbound connection to mining pools. Also, it's worth taking quickly a look at this pretty generic and pretty useful outbound macro that a lot of Falco rules use. As you can see, basically it checks for the events of the syscall being executed on your machine to be either a connect or a send to or a send message and for the, the connection being in progress and not words uh, private networks, okay, or towards local addresses, and to be uh, EPV4 or EPV6. All right, so far, so good. The problem is that the code that Xiaofei X, thank you, my friend, 
presented to me was able to reliably bypass those Falco rules by exploiting a talk toe in the kernel 100% of the time. I was like, oh my, how is that even possible? Well, such code uh, was exploiting a risk window between the moment the BPF trace point read the argument, for example, the destination AP, and the moment the kernel actually executes the syscode with its arguments. The core issue is that syscall arguments are read at two different points in time. The delta between those two moments represent the time window into which the attack replaces the malicious argument with a good-looking one that the BPF trace point will eventually read. It's important to note anyways that the beauty of this bypass was that it worked again any tool using BPF syscall trace point as a mean of detecting malicious activities and threats, not only against Falco, which I'm using because having worked a lot on it, I'm very familiar with it. Let me say this aloud before people sue me. I will not explain the bypassing technique here in detail because it's not the goal of this talk, but I strongly recommend you to go watch Xiaofair X talk at DEF CON for more details on it. It's worth it, trust me. So, long story short, this attack connects to IP 1.1.1.1, which we are considering malicious just for the sake of uh, the de this demo, while the Falco BPF probe detects another IP, and for this reason, it doesn't trigger any alert at all. But let's see it in action. I feel pragmatic right now. Uh, first thing, we need a Falco rule that detects connections to 1.1.1.1. I've already prepped one. Let's take a look at it. Okay, as you can see in this little YAML file, uh, I basically coped the outbound micro I showed before, and I wrote a Falco rule called unexpected outbound connection destination that basically used this macro together uh, with a check on the destination IP to not be 1.1.1.1. So if this is an outbound connection and the destination IP is 1.1.1.1, Falco should alert. Okay, let's check it. Falco starts. Now simply let's curl 1.1.1 and it works. Look. As you can see, Falco detects outgoing connection to the target IP in normal situations. But what if I run the bypass I was mentioning before? Notice that for this bypass to work and just to be vulnerable, uh, it needs to have a privileged user fault if deactivated. Let's check its CCTR knob. It's one. Okay, in this case, we are vulnerable. But first, let me run TCP down because why not? And now let me run the attack. Boom. As you can see, the attack succeeded connecting to the 1.1.1.1 IP, this is its integer representation, and TCP dump catches it while Falco doesn't. IAI BPF syscall trace point. Okay, in Falco 0.9.1, I implemented an initial workaround binding support for tracing the user fault syscall, which is the attack driver that cell phase code is using to swap the syscall arguments under the hood. In fact, if we run Falco 029.1 with the default rule set that contains a rule for it and the attack, we can see that Falco emits a critical alert about user fault to FD getting cold. But aside from the fact that there are also other means that I will not present here, no, no, to meet the same preconditions that this bypass requires, as it is at the moment, my patch just makes Falco scream about user fault if this is called getting cold, but does not provide any detail or deep visibility on what is really happening after it. Furthermore, with little modification, this attack called work uh, also for other uh, syscalls like rename, unlink, create that, send to, you name it. So, what will be an actual and truly meaningful fix? Or more, there's even a way to avoid this to happen at all? This is the question. In my opinion, a certain condition against the actual arguments getting used by the kernel would be the best way to go for detection tools, but first of all, how to grab them? And to do so, we need to first understand a little bit better the syscalls flow in the Linux kernel. Let's take a look at this old image of the flow of the open syscall that I have on my laptop. The flow for other syscalls in the end is very similar, and 
and Xofi also provided a bypass for the open. So when a process in user space calls the open syscall on a file path, uh, the syscall is dispatched and the path string is used to obtain a kernel file object and an inode object. If the parameters are incorrect, error is returned as usual, but then the normal DSC discrete access control file permission checks are checked, and if they are satisfied, the LSM framework enters the game, it acts for each of the file LSM oaks for all the enabled LSMs, also the BPF ones if there are. And finally, or if all those security checks pass, the file is opened for the user space process and the new file descriptor is returned to it. It's important to note how deep in the syscall flow the LSM hooks are, which is not the case for the BPF syscall to respond. Not convinced yet? Want to take a look at the kernel code for the connect, syscall, and just one of the various LSM network hooks? Okay, you want it. Don't blame me. <laughs> well, taking a look at the kernel is always the right thing to do. So, here in the LSM hooks depths either, you can find all the hooks the LSM framework provides. For example, this one at line 208 is the one we are interested in for blocking Sophie to connect it to 1.1.1.1, isn't it? In fact, if we go take a look at the definition of the connect syscall in the socket.c file here, syscall define, sysconnect, sysconnect, move address to kernel, sysconnect file if the arguments are moved successfully to the kernel, and sysconnect file calls this function security socket connect. If we go inspect what this function is and does, we suddenly realize it is the function that calls the socket connect LSM hook. So is this a ringing bell for you? As we have seen, LSM hooks are very low in the syscall's flow and happens after arguments have been moved to the kernel. So to prevent our friend Sophie or any program using his fantastic technique to connect to 1.1.1.1 to provide a real security layer, we may want to use this LSM hook and attach a BPF program to it. And it's easier than anything, but just be aware that this feature is new and it requires a kernel greater than 5.7. Furthermore, ensure your kernel is configured with the options config BPF LSM and config debug info BTF. Also, you need to have LSM BPF activated. To check it, take a look at the LSM kernel boot parameters or at the config underscore LSM configuration. So basically, like this. Okay, we can write some LSM BPF. Time to get our hands dirty with some LSM BPF. Finally, please meet Restrict Connect. This little BPF program that I've written to attach to the socket connect LSM MOOC. As you can see, it's simpler than you think. With the sec helper macro, I'm marking the following function to handle the LSM socket connect LSM hook. Then by using BPF prog macro, I'm gaining the benefit of not having to mess around with the registers and I can simply declare the signature of the function to contain the same parameter as the socket connect hook that we've inspected before in the kernel. Notice also that I'm appending a red parameter that I check in the function. In fact, since various programs can be attached to this LSM hook, I have to respect the cannot override a denial rule, meaning that if this function is not the first one attached to the LSM socket connect to, and the previous one returned a value different than zero, then I have to hex it from it and respect the decision of the previous program attached to the O. The rest is pretty straightforward. I know non-EPV4 protocols because it, this is just the example. I obtain the destination IP and I check it against a value, the value that I want to block. Uh, a value that I've already coded here for the sake of simplicity, but here we could also look up into the BPF map. Please notice this is the same number that the attack uh, connect outputs when it succeeds. So it's the IP representation of 1.1.1.1. Let's run it now. A lot of relocations. Let's attach to the trace pipe. Let's first simply test it by issuing this command. Code connect. Whoa. Look. Okay. 
but let's be serious and try it against the bypass. Error connecting, operation not permitted, LSM blocking. LSM blocking, oops. Operation not permitted, connection to 1.1.1 .1 block. Sorry, my friend. This is good, isn't it? In the repository I'm gonna share at the end of the talk, you'll also find the C code to attach restrict connect thanks to the BPF to the lesson book actually, uh, make file to compile everything and stuff. But now that we are deep into this house on rabbit hole, let's keep the focus. What if we do not want to block connection to 1.1.1.1, but we want to receive the correct syscall arguments? So we want to have deep visibility about this nation IP address. We've seen BPF syscall trace point are not that reliable in our use case. So let's make a step further and let's try to answer this question. First idea that I come up with is let's attach a kernel probe, so a key probe, to the security socket connect function that calls the socket connect LSM hook that we've seen before in the kernel. Do you remember? As said, syscall arguments at this stage should have been already moved to the kernel, so we should be able to see 1.1.1.1 and not another P. But we need to try. I need to try. I'm not sure. I wrote this other little BPF program called Keyprobe Connect. Yeah, the name is a bit misleading, but who cares? Let's take a look at it. Also, in this case, I use the SEC helper macro. Please notice that instead of the BPF prog, Helper and using the BPF key probe one year. It serves the same purpose uh, as BPF prog, but this is specifically for key probes. Thanks to it, I can declare a signature like this and easily having the arguments of the security socket connect function without getting crazy. In a way, very similar to the previous BPF LSM program, this key probe BPF program uh, checks for the protocol. Okay, I'm only caring about IPv4 at the moment. And then, uh, in this case, I restrict uh, the output in the trace pipe of this program depending on the program causing the connection. Tac, connect, okay? The rest is simple. I cast the address to an IPv4 basically and I print it out. Let's run it. The attack. Ready? Set? Go. Alright, fine. Correct destination. Hey, please wait a minute. Let's not get carried away so easy. Are we really sure this approach with key probes works 100% of the time? Are we sure it's reliable? Or it gets easily fooled by the attack on NetBiner just like the BPF syscall tree spawns? I'm short on time and I'll probably uh, write some tests uh, to assess the reliability of various approach soon. In the meantime, take a note of the repo. It's oral is this one. You can find it on my GitHub. Here you'll find also other BPF programs to play with and understand how much uh, secure and correct info they give to you. Now, let me also tell you why I wanted to show you various experiments and do some considerations. The main reasoning was to prove why LS and BPF are here to stay and are the way to go. They were reshaping, improving it, the way that we currently do security buff on prevention and on detection side. But they are a fairly new feature that is not available in all the kernels. So I thought that showing you a key probe approach, given they exist on older kernels too, was worth a try. Even though, pause a second to consider that attaching a key probe to the function calling an LSM hook makes it somewhat dependent on this new feature that's not available in older kernels. So maybe it's better uh, to experiment with key probes on something else like TCP v4 connect function, but this is another exercise for the audience at all. Furthermore, what does it take to use LSM BPF programs for auditing? It's just a matter of changing a bit the restrict connect program we've seen before by making it always returning zero, so not blocking connections to specific IPs, and taking note of the detected destination IP, maybe putting them in an BPF ring buffer or in an BPF map. I prep this audit connect example 
that basically implements what I've just said. Let's check it out. As you can see, I'm always through dialing zero, okay? I'm just clamping the program depending on the binary making the connections, and I'm outputting the destination IP uh, in the trace pipe. As you may notice, it's very similar to the restrict connect previously shown BPF program, and it's an LSM1. It's time to test it. Let me run TCP dump to see where packets go. Attack time. Okay, the bypass is not able to use the race window and it's connected to 13.107, etc. And the LSM is catching it correctly. Let's try it again. Oh, the attack is connected to the malicious IP, as you may see also from TCP dump and from its output. And the LSM is getting the actual destination IP, the malicious one. Try again. Not able to use the race window. Not able to use the race window. It's working. Easy peasy lemon squeezy, isn't it? So not only using LSM and BPF for road editing is possible, it's also, in my opinion, the recommended and future-proof way to go. Another um, work would be to investigate whether BPF prog type tracing BPF programs, a new kind of tracing problem, are vulnerable to this family of talk to attack or investigate the network trace points. In the repository, I've put an example for you all to try out. Now, go write and try them, and please ping me back with the results of your experimentations. I'm so curious. My Twitter DMs are always open. Recap time. Today we've learned various things. First, that by providing Linux with a standard API for policy enforcement, LSM ensures to enable the wide-speed deployment of security hardened systems. The protections provided by LSMs do help protect your system from being hacked when an attacker uses flows in one of the running programs. LSMs are definitely an important layer in any serious defense in depth strategy on Linux machines. We've also learned that BPF Cisco trace points are not that reliable as we may have hoped, and also that LSM hooks happen at a very, very deep level in the Cisco's flow, and they can be used for buff prevention and auditing with little to zero effort. So I'd say it's all for today. Thank you for joining us. Ciao.